Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about volatile alcohols and we'll cover some basic concepts. Please view my earlier lecture on osmolal gap before proceeding further. The links are in description below. So let's start with an example. You found your patient plasma osmolality to be 350. The sodium is 140, B1 is 28 and glucose is 90. You go ahead and calculate the plasma osmolality to be 295. You found osmolal gap to be 350 minus 295, that's 55. That's a high osmolal gap, so your patient likely has volatile alcohol ingestion. So let's look at next few steps. Check if your labs gives you ethanol levels. Say for example, your ethanol levels were 92. You go ahead and find the osmolality contribution by ethanol using the divisor 4.6 and you find your calculated plasma osmolality to be 319. Your osmolal gap now is 31. However, still you have got gap that is not explained by ethanol. So your patient must have taken something else beside ethanol. One of the things to notice is the multiplication factor of 1.2. As we talked about before, the divisor is molecular weight divided by 10. So where does that 1.2 comes from? This increased osmotic activity of ethanol is believed to be its binding to water molecules. So for example, in the first case, if there is no water binding, you have got three molecules in 15 molecules of water. So your osmolality is 0 0.2. However, if you do have binding to water molecules, the effective amount of solvent has decreased, so your relative osmolality is higher. However, other studies refute this finding and they believe that the variation occurs because there are other solutes in the solution like sodium, nitrogen and glucose. In our further discussion, we'll use this factor of 1.2 in calculating osmolality component from ethanol. To convert milligram per dl to milliosmol per liter, find the molecular weight of the compound and divide it by 10. So if your lab also gives you methanol level in milligram per dl, you can divide this level by 3.2 to get milliosmol per liter and add it to your calculated p-osmolality. And if you still see that there is osmolal gap present, there might be a third ingestion present. So let's try to bring all these together. There are five main volatile alcohol poisoning which are important. Methanol, ethanol, ethylene glycol, propylene glycol and isopropanol. This is how they are all metabolized. We'll go into details in our next lecture. First question that you have to ask is what kind of intake they did. So methanol is present in adulterated alcohol, ethylene glycol in antifreeze, propylene glycol comes from IV drips, usually lorazepam drips and isopropanol is present in rubbing alcohol. As you can see, the first four alcohols have acid intermediates. So these four are associated with anion gap metabolic acidosis. However, isopropanol is metabolized completely to acetone. So there is no anion gap present. However, understand that anion gap acidosis will be absent if patient presents very early. Remembering different clinical presentation in the alcohol is difficult. So we'll try to put them all together and look at their important clinical findings. In methanol, formaldehyde and formic acids, they affect your vision. So these patients will have visual problem. In ethanol, there'll be accumulation of acetyl QA, which will be converted into beta-hydroxybutyrate, which can be checked in the serum. Ethane glycol results in oxalic acid, which forms calcium oxalate crystal. So examine the urine for crystal urea. Oxalic acid combines with calcium, so can cause hypocalcemia as well. Propylene glycol is metabolized mostly into lactate, so this can result in lactic acidosis. Isopropanol is converted into acetone, so you can check it by looking at urine ketones. As you have seen in the previous slide, all these alcohols require alcohol dehydrogenase to get metabolized into further components. So try to inhibit this enzyme if needed. And what you're looking for is toxic metabolites. So for example, in methanol and ethylene glycol, you have toxic metabolites like formaldehyde, formic acid, and glycolic acid and glycoxylic acid. So in these two cases, you have to inhibit alcohol dehydrogenase so that methanol and ethylene glycol don't form toxic compounds that would cause 
problem in your patients. For this, use formipizole or ethanol, which are potent alcohol dehydrogenase inhibitors. If you do not have toxic metabolites, for example in propylene glycol and isopropanol, which make lactic acid and acetone respectively, you do not need to inhibit alcohol dehydrogenase. Formipizole is a competitive inhibitor of alcohol dehydrogenase and has 1000 times greater affinity for alcohol dehydrogenase than ethanol. It is cleared by dialysis, so its dose needs to be adjusted. And good thing is it does not cause mental status changes. If you do not have formipizole, you can certainly use ethanol. However, understand that it can cause mental status changes and is only 20 times more potent. Formipizole is metabolized in liver, converted into 4-carboxypyrazole and excreted in urine. Make sure that you get a loading dose followed by 10 mg per kg every 12 hours for 4 doses and then 15 mg per kg every 12 hours thereafter till you have undetectable levels or levels are below 20 mg per dl. During dialysis, dosing should be more frequent as this compound is dialyzable. Don't use formipizole in ethanol intoxication as ethanol will persist as it cannot be metabolized and your patient will be high for much longer. Second principle is try to keep these acids in their ionic form. As you know, any acid will equilibrate with its own dissociation constant. The neutral molecules can cross the cell membrane. However, the ionic form cannot cross the cell membrane as they are charged. It is the intracellular form that causes toxicity. So one of the easy thing that you can do is shift the reaction towards the right by alkalinizing the serum using sodium bicarbonate. That will keep them into their ionic form and keeps them out of cell. Try to maintain your pH more than 7.35 using this method if possible. One of the common mistakes that you can do is when you place them on mechanical ventilation and you do not provide them with enough minute ventilation. You have to match the minute ventilation as the patient was breathing before and possibly surpass it as well. What you're trying to do is making them alkalotic so that you can shift this reaction towards the right. If you fail to give them enough minute ventilation, you will induce respiratory acidosis on top of metabolic acidosis and your patient will have poorer outcome as all these acid form can cross cell membrane and cause more toxicity. Since gastric absorption of volatile alcohol is pretty rapid, gastric level is usually not helpful. These are all small molecules, so they are easily dialyzable, so you can use dialysis to remove them. Intermittent dialysis is better than the CRRT. However, there are few studies that have not found any significant difference in the treatment outcomes between the two groups. And if you do not have intermittent hemodialysis, it's okay to use CRRT. Understand that formipizole only changes the situation from an emergent or urgent hemodialysis to a semi-urgent dialysis. You would need some form of dialysis to remove these compounds. One of the other important thing to remember is formipizole will be useless if patient presents much later when all the osmolal gap has converted to anion gap. That means the acids are present and not the original compound. These patients will still need emergent dialysis. Since volatile alcohol levels are sent out labs or they come in very late, follow serum osmolal gap to evaluate removal and use anion gap to follow levels of toxic acid formation. In methanol poisoning, make sure that you avoid systemic anticoagulation as it can increase the development of intracerebral hemorrhage. So let's look at the management of all these five alcohols. The ones shown in red are toxic. So you would like to minimize their production. So you can use formipizole in methanol and ethylene glycol toxicity. You avoid it in ethanol and isopropanol toxicity. In patient with propylene glycol, you can certainly use it if there is a severe lactic acid formation and the patient is very unstable. Try to keep these acid into ionic form using sodium bicarbonate in patient with methanol and ethylene glycol toxicity. Use folic acid for methanol as it can help convert formic acid into carbon dioxide and thymine and pyridoxine in ethylene glycol toxicity as it helps convert glycolic acid and glycoxylic acid into less toxic intermediates. Since you have formation of calcium oxide crystal in ethylene glycol, 
give them IV fluid and use diuretic to prevent formation of crystals in kidneys. In propylene glycol, the usual reason for the toxicity is IV lorazepam or other drugs. So discontinue these medications. For ethanol and isopropanolol toxicity, the treatment is supportive. Dialysis can be used for methanol, ethylene glycol, and in very severe cases of propylene glycol and isopropanolol toxicity. The three ketone bodies we know are estoestate, which can be converted into acetone or beta-hydroxybutyrate. And as we have seen, isopropyl alcohol results in formation of acetone and ethanol results in accumulation of beta-hydroxybutyrate. So urine ketones can be used to diagnose isopropyl alcohol and blood ketone levels of beta-hydroxy can be used to look for ethanol-induced ketoacidosis. All the urine tests are not equal. Different tests have different sensitivity for acetoestate and acetone. Few tests like keto sticks do not check for acetone. The co most common test that we use is nitroprusside test, which is more sensitive to acetoestate than acetone, but still you should be able to see the level of acetone. However, the beta-hydroxybutyrate is not caught through urine screen. Some of the pitfalls to understand. Always consider other causes for altered mental status, even if the patient had a bottle of antifreeze next to him. You can inadvertently miss trauma, intracranial hemorrhage, or other ingestion like Tylenol. An iron gap metabolic acidosis is absent in early presentation, so be aware of this fact. Understand which compound in the pathway is causing damage to your patient and try to minimize its production. If the end products are harmless, let the body metabolize them and give them supportive care as you do in ethanol or isopropyl alcohol poisoning. We will discuss the individual alcohols in our next lecture. Thank you.